Welcome to another Swordmaster Publications presentation. My name is Ernie Lawrence. Today we're going to be studying Joshua chapter 7. Now, Joshua chapter 7 is one of those texts where people will come to and because of a misunderstanding or because of a, a lack of a broader knowledge of the scriptures, they will try to attack the Bible and, and show that God is evil for having done this or that or whatever. And uh, we're going to show today that uh, their proof text is just not what they think it is. So here we have uh, Jericho has fallen, and Joshua is going to continue the campaign, and he doesn't realize that somebody has done something that they shouldn't do. And uh, there's going to be a whole uh, trial and a whole thing that comes out because of it. So let's, let's go ahead and get started in verse 1 and see what happens. It says, But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. Remember, the accursed thing was if they were to find anything of uh, the gods or anything that, that should be burned up or, or whatever, and they kept it for themselves, or if it was gold or silver, that should go uh, to the temple uh, or to the tabernacle and, and be used for uh, the stuff that, that uh, was going to be used to uh, be sanctified in the temple. It basically was supposed to go to God. Um, and if anybody kept anything for themselves, it was not going to go well for them. It's not going to go well for Israel as a whole. And so um, it says the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. So the whole nation was uh, considered guilty because of the covenant relationship that they had with God. And it says for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, and of the tribe of Judah, took the accursed thing. And the anger, anger of Jehovah was kindled against the children of Israel. So you have this guy who is fifth generation from Judah. Now, again, if you understand how far we are removed from uh, the tribes going in, remember Judah was the son of Israel, and Judah with his family went into um, Egypt with uh, children and uh, even grandchildren in some cases, and we are uh, only four generations removed from that time period when they leave Egypt. And then you have in uh, the wilderness, everybody over 20 dies. And so uh, this guy Achan is one of those who would have been the fifth generation who would have been under 20 um, when they wandered around but by the time they get here uh he would have been under 60 he would have been an older man his kids would have been uh grown and, and had their own kids at this point in time <coughs> so understand who this is and how old this guy is because it's going to come into play a little bit later he's he's young enough that he was part of those who went into jericho uh as one of the warriors but he was young enough or he was old enough um that he uh would have been of the generation that was uh, that came out of Egypt, and so it says uh, Joshua, uh, or and the, and the anger of Jehovah was kindled against the children of Israel, and so Joshua, not knowing what's going on yet, uh, sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside uh, Bethaven on the east of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai. Um, and make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. So these spies go in, they, they check out Ai, and, and they realize that Ai is not very big. It's just kind of small, and they're like, we can take them. We don't need to send everybody, just send a few men. They already know that God is on their side. They know that God has given them uh, the land. And so with this confidence, the spies come back and say, you only need to send a few men because it's small. We can, we can take them with just a few people. Um, and so Joshua listens to them, and he, says, uh, he sends up uh, that many. He says, so there went up there of the people about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai. So they get there, and they, they're going to take Ai, and they lose, and they, they are uh, turned back. Verse 5, And the men of Ai smote of them about 36 men. So 36 men died because somebody did not do what God had commanded them to do with regard to Jericho. For they chased them from before the gate, even into Shebarim, 
and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. So here these people have come in, they've had this great victory at Jericho, and you can see, kind of hear how fickle the people of Israel are. If things are going great, they're suddenly, yes, let's do this, we got this, we're good, God's on our side. The moment anything goes bad, and they're all like, like it's it's the end of the world for them. Instead of realizing, hey, something's wrong, something we need to take care of something. And so they're, they're very, very back and forth, very wishy-washy here. <clears throat> and so Joshua, realizing something's up, he tears his clothes, he falls to the earth upon his face before the ark of Jehovah until the evening. He and the elders of Israel and put dust on their heads. So they they go right to God and they're like, what have we done? What is wrong? Um, and, and they understand the source of where they need to go. Verse 7, And Joshua says, Alas, O Jehovah God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? With God we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. So, God, why did you bring us over here if all you're going to do is end up letting us destroy? Now, Joshua is being a little melodramatic here, too. He's he's in line with the Israelite people being, um, you know, going one way and then going the other. Uh, so 36 people dying out of 3,000 in, in terms of warfare, not really big. Um, you know, the loss of any kind of life, of course, is, is horrible. But um, 36 out of 3,000 as a commander of an army not that big of a deal I probably would not have been so melodramatic about it um, certainly you would not approach God with all of this that all of the drama that he that he does um, and so he says you know we, we would have been content to dwell on the other side of the Jordan uh, if you were going to just bring us here to destroy us here and then he says in verse 8 O Jehovah what shall I say when Israel turns their backs before their enemies for the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it then shall environ us around and cut off our name from the earth, from the land. And what will you do unto your great name? So he kind of turns it back on God and says, God, if you're going to make us lose, even after you told us you would give us this land, it's your name that's going to be dis besmirched. And so you kind of have this idea of of pushing things off onto God and, and, and making it about him. Um, but God's not having any of it. And so verse 10, he says, And Jehovah said unto Joshua, Get up. Why are you lying on your face? Okay. And then he says, Israel has sinned. So God's saying, look, the proper blame does not lie with me. I told you not to do these things, and you did. And somebody did these things, and now the whole nation is suffering because of it. Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have stolen and dissembled also. That means they lied about it. And they have put it even among their own stuff. So God tells them what's wrong. Now note here this way that God approaches Israel. One man, one man has done something wrong. And it says in verse 1, Achan has, has done this thing. And God holds the whole of Israel accountable for it. And when you go look in uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 6, and the, God talks about the, the temple, uh, or he talks about his bride in various places, um, there's this idea of a purity, of, a, of a, a, an unblemished bride, or a, an, a spotless uh, church. And so when one person sins, um, and, and Paul uses the, uh, idea of the prostitute at that point uh, that for him to for this person to lie with a prostitute it tarnishes the entire church the reputation of the entire church is tarnished and so um, when you understand that it becomes easier to understand in chapters 3 and 6 of 1st Corinthians and other places that um, it isn't the human body that's being talked about as the temple there. It's the whole church as a single unified uh, organization. So same thing is here. It was one man that sinned. And yet all of Israel is paying the price for it. And we need to keep that in mind as Christians. When, when we do uh, things that are wrong, when we sin, it's not just us that faces the consequences of that. It's people looking and oh, that person's a Christian, but they live like this. And what does that do 
to the purity and, and the reputation of the bride of Christ. And it's, it, it's not an unknowable, or that's just something that was done in the Old Testament. How could God hold the entire nation responsible for that? He holds the church responsible for it, too. That's why church discipline is so uh, absolutely important. So, anyway, uh, verse 12, God says, Because of that, therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more, except you destroy the accursed from among you. Okay, so who's accursed? It's the one that took the stuff. <coughs> oh, sanctify your people. That means make them clean. Uh, and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, for thus says Jehovah God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the middle of you. O Israel, you cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which uh, Jehovah selects shall come according to the families thereof, and the family which Jehovah shall select shall be by households, and the household which Jehovah shall select shall come by man. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire, he, then all, he and all that he hath, because he has transgressed the covenant of Jehovah, and because he has wrought folly in Israel. Now, this is what God commands. This is God's command here. That's important to understand this. All right. First of all, this is not Joshua commanding this. This is something that God is commanding, and God is going to be the one who uh, does this. Also note that when God calls, he calls the entire tribe, everybody who is here on this side of the Jordan who is part of this. Um, now, understand, we're talking largely about the military at this point like the people that are camped here um we're we're talking about the the military as it moves forward okay um but you also have as following along with that all of the families all the livestock everybody that is is coming along only the the two and a half tribes that are on the other side of the jordan don't have their families and, and their belongings and stuff all that got left over on the other side of the jordan Okay, but this is the tribe of Judah, so we're going to be talking about all of the, the property this guy has. But look at what it says here. Uh, with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire, he and all that he hath. So all of his belongings. All right. Some people are going to try to say that yeah, that included his family, but we'll talk about that in just a minute. So Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. So all of the tribes show up. And God selects the tribe of Judah. And then, uh, and this is showing the responsibility, how this responsibility kind of trickles up. So now we have the tribe of Judah is responsible. And then he brought uh, the family of Judah and he took the family of the Zerites. So the Zerites are selected out of the tribe of Judah. And he brought the family of the Zerites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. And he brought his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah was taken. So note, all these people are descendants from these people. So Judah, no longer alive. Uh, Zerah, the son of Judah, no longer alive. Zabdi, the son of Zerah, no longer alive. And Carmi, the uh, son of Zabdi, also no longer alive. He was that fourth generation that actually came out of Egypt as an adult. And Achan would have been one of those that was under 20 years old and uh, was alive when they came out of Egypt, but was not part of the, um, the ones who didn't make it, the ones who died in the wilderness. So Achan is, is an older man now. He's 40 years older than what he was when, um, when we get into Numbers chapter 14, I believe it was, where the spies came back. And, and they'd only been out of Egypt for a year, and they were going to have to wander for 40 years. So Achan would have been in the group that was too young to have been to have been cursed and fall in the wilderness. <coughs> so that's that's who this is. And he has sons and daughters. He He's old enough to have sons and daughters. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to Jehovah God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what you have done, and do not hide it from me. So remember, God has done the selecting. God has, has chosen out of Israel, Judah, out of Judah, the families, all the way down, and he has selected Achan. He, God has said he's the man. So we have direct uh, knowledge from God that Achan is the dude 
But Joshua says, don't hide it. Don't try to lie. You've already, God has already chosen you. We know you did it. Make the confession. Confess that you did it. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against Jehovah God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. Um, so he makes the confession. He says, I did it. I, I, I sinned against God. He, he admits his guilt. And under the law, what had to be done is what God had commanded to be done. He had to be stoned, and the, the stuff burned with fire. And uh, even though the man confesses, even if he had repented of his son, he still has to pay the consequence. Because uh, we're during a time of war, he cost the life of 36, lives of 36 men. So he still has to pay that price. All right? And so he says, I sinned, this is what I did. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian uh, garment, and two hundred shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold of fifty shekels weight, I coveted them, and took them. Well, what's one of the, the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not covet, right? And I took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran into the tent, and behold, it was hid in his tent, and the silver under it. So the guy is, is telling the truth. He admitted it. It was exactly where he said it was. So he's he's on the up and up now. He's he's confessed his sin, and they took them out of the midst of the tent. So they took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them unto Joshua, and unto all the children of Israel and laid them out before Jehovah. So this is all of the stuff, okay? And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah, and the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold, and his sons and his daughters and his oxen and his asses and his sheep and his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them unto the valley of Achor. Now, this is where we get into some trouble. So they bring everything this guy has, including his family. We'll pay attention to the wording here. And Joshua said, Why have you troubled us so? Jehovah shall trouble you this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones. Okay, it's singular here. Um, Achan is the one being stoned with stones and burned them with fire after they stoned and and the word there them is not clear that's a, a pronoun that was inserted um it's still singular in terms of the stoning with stones so they stoned him with stones and they burned them with fire according to the the law and according to the commandment that joshua was given by jehovah achan was to be stoned and then all of his goods were to be burned up and then it says, and they raised over him, not them, him, a great heap of stones into this day. So Jehovah turned from the fierceness of his anger, wherefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor, which means troubled unto this day. So <clears throat> did God kill all of Achan's family or tell the Israelites to kill all of Achan's family? Because that's the accusation that God required the death of his, his sons and daughters. Number one. If there had been any sons and daughters or a wife or anybody who was complicit in that and covering up and hiding it, Achan would have been the one responsible, but they would have also been culpable and they should have been stoned according to the law. If they, if they were adults and then they were, were part of the lie and part of the cover-up, they would have been stoned along with everybody else because they, they broke the law as well. And they were the ones, part of the ones that caused those 36 men to die. However... If there had been any children or anybody who was part of the family who was not complicit in it, according to the law, Deuteronomy 24, 16, the father shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. That is the law. God is not going to go against his own law and say, well, we're going to hold the children accountable. And so we have to keep this in as part of the context that if Achan had done a sin and any children that he had, especially young children who wouldn't have understood anything, they would not have been stoned and they would not have been part of the burning. The burning was for the, the material stuff. Again, Ezekiel uh, 18 and verse 20, The soul that sins it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. And so, no generation on either side of the sinner is to be held accountable for the sinner's sin. Only those who are partaking in the sin itself are held accountable. Now, does the consequences 
fit the second, third, and fourth generations. Absolutely. These, these kids were now going to be without a father. Now, again, he's grown. His children are grown. And they are brought there to see the consequences of Achan's sin and, and him being destroyed. But that's not new to Israel. Part of the law was with the, uh, the, the idea of the murderer. If somebody killed somebody and they made it to a, a safe place, there was an avenger of blood that was supposed to be a close family member. And they would bring them out. Or if there was somebody who was a, a, a sinner uh, that was like an adulteress or somebody, the family was supposed to be the ones to bring them out and be the ones that were directly involved in, in stoning them. So the sons and the daughters being brought out, most likely, according to the law, were the ones that threw the first stones. The ones that were getting rid of the sinner from among their people. It was not the case that they were being stoned with Achan, uh, unless they were part of it, but we don't have any indication of that, that Achan himself is the one that, that was the soldier that went in and did all this and tried to hide it all. And so there's no indication here. And then, of course, we have this also in Second Kings 14, verses 5 through 6. And it came to pass, as soon as the kingdom was confirmed in his hand, that he slew his servants, which had slain the king his father. But the children of the murderers he did not sl uh, slay, According unto that which is written in the book of the law of Moses, wherein Jehovah commanded, saying, The fathers shall not be put to death for the children, nor the children to be put to the death for the fathers, but every man shall be put to death for his own sin. So, in this particular case, we can use that broader context, and we can see that in multiple places, um, both in the law, history, and in the prophets, that this law was that only those who took part in the sin are to be um, held accountable. And so Achan is the only one that's held accountable here, but all of his all of his goods, all of his personal goods, uh, gold, silver, tent, any oxen and cattle and all that that were part of his personal belongings, those were all completely burned up, and they were not they would not be passed on to further generations. Now, having said that, again, his children are grown, and they have their own possessions, so. We're not necessarily even taking out of the mouth of young children here. There's no indication that young children are even involved. Just his sons and his daughters. And I'm a son of my father, but I'm grown and I have my own children. So the word son and daughter here, those words don't necessarily indicate young children are being part of this at all. And so just, it, I, I want to make it clear here that there's a lot of people who will attack the Bible, who will look at this and they, they will bring their own biases against the Bible. They don't want to believe the Bible. And so they will think ill of the Bible. Uh, they will think ill of, of God. And those are the kinds of arguments that they will bring to the text. And they're not valid. They don't, they don't hold up with a consistency when we take the entirety of the Bible. And most of the people who are bringing these accusations do not understand the entirety of the Bible uh, in, a, in a way that would say, that, okay, I realize I shouldn't bring this argument because it's a bad argument. They would, they would never bring it if they knew that there was this kind of an answer for it. So um, anyway, I hope that helps you, uh, helps arm you a little bit against those who would uh, attack the Bible. Uh, there's more here. There's, there's the severity of doing things God's way. Don't go beyond what God says. If God says don't touch something, don't touch it. Um, and we see here also the, the Israelites, the back and forth. That, oh, we lost one time. We lost 36 men. Uh, we should have stayed on the other side of the Jordan. Israel really needs to maintain their focus on God. Okay, God, we realize that you're with us. But we also realize that somebody messed up. And hopefully that's the lesson that they learn here as, as we're going forward through the book of Joshua. Is like when they lose in future battles temporarily, because we know they take the whole land. When they lose temporarily, their question is not, God, you should have left us on the other side of the Jordan, but God, who messed up and what do we need to do to take care of it? That's the proper way to do it instead of getting all melodramatic and stuff like this. So anyway, that's Joshua chapter 7, um, a very uh, intense chapter. Uh, because of the content of it and, and what people have to say about it. But uh, hopefully we were able to answer that question sufficiently. If ever you have questions, please let me know. Leave comments. Um, subscribe. Those are uh, those numbers always help uh, other people see it when they're doing searches and stuff like that. Um, but I appreciate you uh, continuing with me on this journey, and we'll see you next time for Joshua Chapter 8. 
My name is Ernie Lawrence, and this has been another Swordmaster Publications presentation. We'll see you next time.